Hey, here we are. Let's see. Hello. Ooh, went to gallery just like that. All right. All right. All right. What do we got? Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Everybody out there in Clarion Live land, this is the Clarion Live open webinar. Um, today is Wednesday, the 17th of May, 2023. With me today are special guests who rarely, rarely appear on this webinar. They're, uh, they're both talented presenters who are currently doing training on CIDC 2023. Got the first session out of the way last week. We did. And, and this week, for that matter. And they did a great job. Uh, the ever fabulous Bruce Johnson and Andy Wilton. Good morning. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have Hi, anything. Give me a hand. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got no sound effects for them this webinar. Uh, anyway, this is Q&A day. So if you have a question, please put it in the questions box. Um, we'll do our best to answer them. If there are no questions, then we chat for a few minutes and then we leave. So that's how that goes. Currently, there are no questions. I have a so question. You do? Okay. Oh, a question just came up too. Go ahead, Andy. Uh, it's a Sequin, Sequin 7 question. Um, there is obviously the login screen. Um, which I know works off a login template and so on. But technically, if we didn't want to use your login screen and completely create our own, could we do it? Absolutely. And what method? Yeah. And what would you well, call? Well, it's just, would you, you, it's, it's the name of it's not important because the name of it's not important. Oh, no, no, method. From the global. To log in, what would you call? Oh, um, so if you look, the best way to figure that out is to look in the generator class. Um, in, in, sorry, in, in the example one, and you'll yep. see that there's a bunch of code generated in there. Mm -hmm. um, for those and who are good with templates, you can go back and look at the, there's a template that generates the code. So you can see there's specific code that generates into that procedure, um, which would generate into any procedure that you wanted. Although how much you vary from the main one depends on how much that generated code will make sense. But yes, the login class is is not linked to a particular window structure or anything like that. Yep. But the methods, the methods are just there to do a login. So uh, yeah, if you look at the generator code, um, the easy way, just look at the, uh, generate the code with the extension template in there, generate the code with it out, and then you compare the two bits of code, you'll yep. see the code that's getting generated. No, that's fine. The reason I ask is, We've taken, we use the login window, so there's no problem with that, and, uh, and that's great. But we've taken, stripped out um, certain stuff out of our main app, and we're using that as our training app. But of course, I don't want it to be reliant on, on anything. So at the moment, yeah. it hasn't got a login window. But it would be nice to just have a standard window uh, and so on and so forth. Well, do I just go with a standard, and then I can backport it, and just in my version, call sequence login stuff, or do I just knock together a very simple is the username and password? I might go with the latter, to be fair, but I just wanted to know, could it be done um, if I wanted to, to, to sure. do that? Sure. I, mean, the, I don't the want to necessarily login... do it for the main app. It was just, you know, could Yeah. It? I mean, the second login window, the window is just a window, but the, mm. the login obviously is tied into the sequence system, the actual login part of it. So because of, logins are stunningly more complicated than you think they should be. I've got a flowchart in the docs that shows the logic of the login procedure, the login path, if you like, class. Mm. And it's just bonkers how complicated a login screen needs to be to do all the things we kind of just expect of a login. Like, for example, oh, you've forgotten your password. Okay, you, there must be a reset password button. Or I just want to log in as a guest because I don't have a login in the system, but I just want to try it out without being a real person. I just want to come in as a guest. Or I need to be able to interact with the Active Directory because my login is going to be set by my Active Directory guy. And, and it goes on and on and on. Every, you know, second feature, uh, you know, do, does the user have to change his password on a regular basis? Can a user sign up? Different programs, right. different contexts, obviously, different policies. Um, even password policies goes on for days. How many times can you try before it locks you out? Um, there, 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 there are a million login features that one can have. So I think if you're making a little program, my suggestion would be make a, a trivial login. 
as in user table, login, hash of a password. And I think and we're then, going to do that. Yeah, and it's going to be easier. Um, yeah. And then if, if someone wants a real world login, yeah, they're going to do something like Sequin or, or, or they can roll their own, but to do all the login features is a lot of work. <laughs> it's yeah. a lot of... No, no, we, we use a lot it. Of things it was just for the, uh, the training app and it's now yeah. we've moved Sequin uh, from a training point of view. And of course, we've lost that um, but it's just going to be easier. It's just yeah. going to be easier for, let's say, here's a dummy screen. Like, yeah. And for those who, who have done the training and so on, we've allowed for things like your timestamp field and your timestamp thing, which tie into to, to your distributed app stuff. But yeah, yeah. because we, we use it in ours. Now, I've not bothered stripping that out because someone might make use of it uh, and so you, on. You but I can't it, go and it's, and it's not dependent on templates. Something, sure. In. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I get it, and that's 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 the balance of we saw to the examples with Mike that we've been doing the the re, rehash clone examples. Mm. John's seeing the same thing with um, something you did. Oh, in debug view plus plus uh, your your ultimate debug viewer. There's there's features that are very simple to do with the right templates, but you want to make something that's open source, so therefore you can't use those features. Re recreating like a lot of wheels. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to discover when it comes to set the font. That like you have to write when your mountains of code to do something that should take a minute, um, but it's a minute and then becomes dependent on something. So it's 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 that balancing act of how useful the example is in the real world. Um, you know the clarion box only takes you so far, and and to be fair, things like Sequin or libraries built in Clarin for Clarin on top of Clarin, and so you absolutely can go ahead and write all of that into an example. It'll just take a month's worth of work, and you know, <laughs> you, you, <laughs> you know, you get nothing for it. So it's it's kind of like we gloss over those bits in examples and say, yeah. oh, well, if you want to do proper security, they're proper security libraries. If you want to do uh, the, the mimic of a security, then and people who do that since they begin, you know, day, day the, the, the only thing we needed for the demo is really to identify two different users, just tying in with a calendar. So you're looking at yours or you're looking at that and that kind of thing. So it's not really, really, and maybe some personal settings in the system. Yeah, but exactly. It's only against a, a user, not all the security things of it. So, so yeah. 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 Very much so. And it's an example. Right. Let's have a look at the questions. Mark's got one on network maps, which obviously, Mark, we will deal with in the network user group tomorrow. Danielle. Danielle, Danielle, Danielle. Danielle, are you there? Hello, everybody. Hi, Danielle. How's it going? <laughs> Good. And you guys? Yeah, not too bad. I see Bruce is dressed for the weather we've got in Joburg. It's frighteningly cold today and is yesterday. It? It's actually, I, 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 I put the um, hat on to come home and then I just haven't taken it off yet. The um, <laughs> It is actually raining here today, so we're getting a bit of rain. Yeah. But it's actually not that cold. It's been colder. The weekend was cold, cold. Freezing yeah. cold. I mean, like get down to short sleeves cold, you know, like maybe put a long sleeve shirt on. Um, cold. It was no, like, it's been mighty no, cold I mean, it was in 10 degrees C, which is what about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. I mean, guys were, I mean, it's just, I don't know how we get through the day. <laughs> That's tropical. <laughs> <laughs> All right. My first question is actually for John. Um, yes. um, many years ago, we picked up Metro buttons and a whole lot of other Metro stuff that used to be by Clarion Live. <laughs> Um, I want to know if that exists anywhere anymore because I don't see it on the Clarion Live website anymore and we still have one old program that runs it. Metro Buttons. That sounds like oh, a... Brad, Brad, Brad did that, didn't he, originally? Yeah, I'm not, where, I'm Yeah, not the, window, the Windows 8 type uh, yeah, interface. I'm sure Brad, Brad did it a long time ago. Was there were there files that were downloaded? Is that what you're looking for? Was it a webinar? Yeah, it's an actual whole template set. Um, oh, really? Okay. But we're having a couple of bugs, and we're not sure if it's related to that template set or not. Um, okay. Well, let me check and see. I don't know if there's another question you want to ask. I'll poke around, and um, I'll let you know. Okay. If I can find it. Super. Thank you. All right. Um, 
Yes, Danielle. My next question relates to we're having an issue when we minimize um, on dual screen where, when you've got um, a, a user that's running dual screen. If they move a window from one screen to the other screen, that works fine all in well. Um, and then they can minimize and maximize as they feel like it. But what we're finding is that it's not minimizing or maximizing where the window is. It's actually minimizing and maximizing on the other screen, not necessarily the screen where the main frame is. So I don't know. I don't know if it's got something to do with... When you say minimizing and maximizing, files, you're minimizing and maximizing the frame, so it goes to your toolbar. So what are you saying? Yeah. No, so if it's it another window, to, it must be a no, no, non-MDI window. window. Yeah, so it's, it's minimizing or maximizing just above the toolbar, but not necessarily on the right screen. Uh, yeah, you got multiple SDI windows. Yeah. So you're minimizing a window, but it's not inside a frame. Yes. Yes. Oh, it's, I think so. Okay. I don't think you can direct it. Can you direct it, Andy? <laughs> um, you, you could you could detect the uh, event, have a look at what it was when it was iconized um, from its location point of view, and then maximize back to that device as settings. No, that's not what she's saying. She's saying that the the, if the it's off on a different monitor text thing comes up on a different monitor, probably your primary monitor, I would imagine. Not necessarily. Oh, hang on, have I got this wrong? So if you minimize the window, you're talking about just a little. I thought you meant. Sorry, Diane, can you just cover it again then, please, Daniel? Well, do you want to show us, Daniel? Yes, I think that would be wise. That'd probably um, make it easier to understand. Yeah, pitch paints a thousand words. <laughs> okay, and you will need to unmute yourself. Okie dokie. So, for example, here is, uh, I'm running dual screens at the moment, okay? Mm -hmm. So here is my main frame and here's a window that is maximizable. Not an MDI child. Yeah, and I can run it on the other screen, maximized and unmaximized. Um, I suppose I can't share both my screens to you, can I? No, but minimize it because no. it's going to come out here, isn't it? That's your point. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. But oh, okay. currently it's it's coming in on the frame screen. But no, if I it's coming in, it's coming in on a monitor. It's got nothing to do with the frame. Move your frame over to the other monitor as well. It, it's gonna be your monitor, tight your monitor, not your not your frame. I would have said. Okay. Yeah, you're right. It's coming in on my primary screen all the time. Yeah. So it's actually got nothing to do with the program oh, yeah. so much as it's coming in on the primary monitor. Well, you could yeah. you can detect. So basically, on the iconize event, you need to know what device it's just you iconized. Uh, can you detect iconizing? Because you really need to know before it's actually physically been iconized. Yeah, but, but you keep going, detect. Andy. You can do that. Where are you going say, to so, after that? So you're going to detect the device uh, that it was on, and that will give you the device will give you its. Um, its, its resolution, its, its, its area, its size, and so on. And then when you're maximizing, you want to restore it back to that, that That's device. That's not the problem, Andy. Oh, okay, no. sorry. When, when she maximizes, it does go back. The problem is it where does. the, right. the minimize bar goes to. Yeah. The minimize bar is going down to the top bottom left corner of her primary monitor. So then and and the our users are not smart your... enough to look on the other screen. They're complaining it's disappearing. Yeah. Okay. So maybe put it... Um, Still put it on down to the you don't bottom put it left. You think it how, well how on the icon. Yeah, what how do you I'm confused by. So, so is, are these all windows running within the same process? Is that right? Yes. Like separate threads. So it's not like it's yeah. separate EXEs and each one gets no. minimized to the taskbar. Yes. Huh. Yes, it's all in the same 
the same. Yeah, because you can see it. Just move your mouse over there. I'm not sure if they're seeing what you what you what you. They, those you'll little see your bottom left. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. That thing no, there. No, it, but I don't think you can control where that goes. No, I don't think so. I, I think there's just it's going to go to your primary screen, and that's it. Um, and the only thing that you could potentially get around. Uh, would be uh, re-architecting your system so that it's multiple. So each thread is a program, and then you start doing all of your inter-program communication via, you know, semaphores or something like that. <laughs> I mean, I uh, it, it, and then every pro every window then becomes a program, which is itemized, uh, minimized to the taskbar. You're not wrong, Mike, but let's assume yeah. that's not. Have that's a diff that's a difficult solution. <laughs> yeah, now, it's really now not worth the problem level of you've complaints. Got no, yeah, you've got yeah. one. You've got one problem, but you could have like four hundred more problems. Yeah, yes, yes. yeah, exactly, exactly. So, you, if it's so when the window is iconized, are we saying we can't set its x and y position when it's iconized? I don't believe so. No, I think that little that little tile thing is just it's just there. It's just, I, I think it becomes there. part I've of never, the operating system. I'm gonna say I've of, never tried, but you know, one would presume. I don't that think you, you could be able to control where that thing goes. Myself. Uh, to be fair, I don't, I don't make for re, this is why I don't make this interface. When with the SCI interface, if you allow people to minimize the, the window, it'll more or less disappear. It makes no difference. Um, and then they say, "Oh, it's disappeared. I don't know where. I don't know how to bring it back." That's because you're doing it outside the frame. If you're doing it inside the frame, obviously you would be able to see it inside the frame. Daniel, as a test, just while we do all the questions, on the yes. detect the iconized event and after. So it's, it's, it has been iconized. Set the windows X and Y pop to zero, both, both to zero. So and let's just see what it does. Well, just let's set it to 100, 100. Set it to 100. Okay, 100, 100, 100. But, but basically from where it's not, where it is now. Yeah. Okay. And something oh, else you, you could theoretically do is is to trap the iconizing event uh, and prevent it from actually becoming iconized and instead just set it to be very small so you only see a little thing like this on the window that it currently is. Yeah, then you could then you could play with the position. Yeah. And That's then when they call. say, please restore, just make your window big again and put it back to where it was. Put it back to it, yeah. And you're not actually changing the device though, are you? Yeah, the trouble is you, you will have to then play around with your resizer. Oh, sure you will. Because your resizer yeah, sure. not going to like the fact yeah, yeah. It's, it's that the window got really bit, tiny. Yeah. It's going to try and invoke itself and you're going to have to have a little thing that says, no, 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 I'm in, I'm in pretend I'm iconized yeah. mode. And, and that's not a big deal either, you know, trapping that iconized event and just make, stopping it from yeah. doing anything until you get out of this mode. Yeah, basically, yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you, guys. And then another very small other problem. If I have a, I have a prompt on the screen here, and I can't get the prompt to display. I don't know why it's not displaying. The prompt is the, there's a prompt on each of these tabs, and each of these tabs has a prompt here. And okay. as you can see, there's no prompt on any of them. Is the prompt outside the sheet control? No, the prompt is inside the sheet control on each tab. But physically but the, outside the space of the sheet control. control. Yeah. Well, it looks like the tabs the are space it, of the it, sheets. It, and it looks like there's a no sheet attribute as well. So it's a Yeah, exactly. I know there were issues with doing that at some point. The the, the system isn't wild about I, by the way, I do that uh, all the time. I've on, never had a problem. Yeah, with but it. you could turn when they went to seven, there was issues because the original window, they they didn't really grasp the concept of having things that were on the sheet, but outside the, they were uh, on the tab, but outside the boundaries of the sheet. Uh, yeah, so really? Cause, cause I've used I, this and it works normally, yeah, but for exactly. some reason this time around, I also can't get it to work. But there was a setting. And I assume that the, the, the prompt is not hidden. You know, that it's it's actually definitely not hidden. Okay. Yeah. And it's fixed so, text. So it's that thing at the top there. Yeah, yeah. It's that box well, there. Well, hang on, hang on, hang on. Change, change the text so it's in black. Change, change, change it so it's not white on blue. Okay. Because maybe it's going now, does to it transparent. The, in which yeah, case, you don't be able to see it. The transparent's not right. on. It just one will do. Just, you don't have to do all the tabs. Just do one tab. I'll do two. Okay, there we go. 
Now run it. No, the transparency is not on mic, but there's no. auto transparency for controls that are on tabs. That's a global setting. Oh yes, I wonder if that setting if that uh, is turned because on. Because people didn't <laughs> set their but prompts to be transparent. There's a suppressed transparency tick box is also on. Yeah, that's, so that's only that's, that's more only of a paint, the, more design, design. paint time. Yeah. Um, okay. I'll show you. I'll show you now. All right. There. So okay. It's got so now what you do? Colors. Yeah. Go to the global. You might. I, I can tell you for free that you're gonna you're gonna just fix it like we did now by changing the text of it. But if you want to see why it's there, go to the your global properties of your app. Uh, that would be under yeah. that one. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Actions. Actions. Yeah. Now yeah. go to app settings. Yeah. Yep. And go to manifest. Uh, and I think uh, the setting extended of the UI manifest. One of the two. Um. No, let's try the other no, one. No, let's try the other one. I think it's towards the bottom into make transparent there. Yes. Make Tools. transparent. Take that off. And and now if you okay. run it, you you'll have fixed your problem, but you'll have twenty other problems. So you'll yeah, yeah, you're going to figure that out. I don't really wonky need now. a blue background. I don't. You know, you can live without the blue background, or or, or put a, a thing behind it. But um, no, because what will happen is all the prompts on your tabs. Well, to untick it and see what what it looks like. Because that's that thing there is a is a crutch. It's, yeah, because if a, you've already done all of your transparent settings properly on your then it, uh, on your tab controls, then it's going to be fine. You shouldn't need that. Yeah, yeah. it was a a lazy fault, weren't it? Yeah, I, I always yeah. turn that off because I hate. I, I don't want to be lazy with setting up my screens. It's just yeah. I'd rather be particular. No, I, I didn't a, even a know about it, but I also tend to do my transparency properly most of the time. This is not my app, though, so anything goes. All right, obviously, because it's um, a global change, it's going to do a, a big compile. Yeah, and then you'll discover all the places you haven't set your trans transparent, and you'll have to decide whether you want to go and set those or whether you uh, will change your headings so they don't have blue backgrounds, white text on blue backgrounds. Well, we are about to change all those headings anyway because... Um, it was just a trial run there. So I'm going to change the colors anyway. So yeah, the key is that you won't have a background color. That's you, you've got to treat the thing as transparent. Yeah. Unless you put like a panel behind it or something like that to, to create a background color. Yeah, we're going to put a box behind it. So yeah, then that's fine. And then um, just another quickie while I'm waiting for this compile to do its thing. See, not too bad for transparency. Still looks kind of the same. Yeah, you need to go to a form. There we go. Now go, so there we go back go. to that form. Go back. Go, go this is you a form. see, stop, 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 slowly, slowly, stop there. Yeah. You see how um, that's not too bad. One of your other tabs. No, I've got to say, it's not bad, though. I'd expect worse. Yeah, that, that looks about right. Oh, they're, they're, they're yeah, there, stop there. Again. You see, top, yeah. top see under, 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 not even spelt right, under writers placement defaults, actual insurer placement defaults, those are all, those in the underwriting status at the top, those aren't transparent. Okay, all of them, yeah, claim, like, aggregate, part, order. Yeah, all those That's, heading type things. Yeah, and they'll be all over the place. And remember, you, it's global setting, so there's not even just the screen. It's everywhere. Okay, cool. No, that's fine. Thank you. I will have a squiz at that and sort that out. Um, yeah, so turn that back on. John's got um, your thing for Metro buttons. I do. Tell me about Metro buttons. Oh, I found uh, the webinar and then I found the source code as well. Uh, he put it on GitHub, so that was kind of cool. So I found that. And if if you go to webinar 198, I yes. put links to the reporting and also to the source code, which goes to the GitHub. So that'll get okay. you all um, that you need. I also posted the link to the GitHub in uh, the chat, but you can't copy that. You'd have to pipe it in. Yeah. But anyway, all right. Thank you. you. No, that's fine. I'll go look that up. Um, we're actually going to pull the metro buttons out because it causes other issues. But um, I actually don't know what it's for or why it's used. So I will go watch that webinar and then at least I'll actually know what's going on with regards to that. Cool. Oh, the other question I was going to ask while it was compiling quickly was um, 
what is the standard now with regards to look and feel around that? I mean, I know that is different from industry to industry and developer to developer, but where can we look to see kind of what the standards are? Do we just gauge it on what we see in Microsoft? Yeah, look at your favorite program, copy them. So um, you're going to know your own thing, what works for you. We take a, we, we look at various different um, favorite apps, I suppose. Um, a lot of settings are like off uh, some web type apps, uh, like um, QuickBooks. There's a lot of settings within Windows itself and go with a good combination of what you, what works for you, what you, what, how you want yours to look, I suppose. But at least if you're looking around at current apps and you're going to be right at the ballpark of current flavors. Yeah, because that's something that's come up. Um, we did a big revamp on our app a couple of years ago because the user said it kind of felt a bit XP-ish. Um, <laughs> I love that phrase. It yeah. looks old. But, well, what do you I'm mean gonna, by looks old? I don't know. It, Show me something that doesn't look old. Or like this <laughs> program. Okay. Yeah, well, so we've done a revamp, but I think we do, what you meant. <laughs> yeah, we, we do for a newer revamp again, you know, but more, I almost want to say webby, but I hate that. So um, I don't actually know. The good news is that, all your existing word. users love the fact the interface keeps changing. They love that. I, as, as a user myself, I'm always particularly excited when Zoom brings up a new window and I have to go find all the things I knew how to do. Or um, <laughs> TeamViewer has decided they've got a new interface and none of the things are where they used to be and I have to go figure it all out again. That that really just gives me something lovely in my day. Um, but, but I'm getting Bruce, a little a hint of between... sarcasm off, John, uh, off uh, Bruce, though, I've got to admit. <laughs> You know, there's a difference between rearranging your screen so that you've actually got to go and find things and just doing a visual overlay that makes it zhuzh it a bit, you know? Yeah. I, mean, so you, I, I agree you know. with you. It's very frustrating when stuff moves and disappears and goes to other windows. Um, yeah. But but you have got to look fresh and modern because you've got to keep your, your, your yes, you don't. The application's got to work for your existing users, but you've still got to look fresh and modern so you can get new users. You're not going to exactly. open many doors. If oh, no, looks... absolutely. The salespeople oh, are... Exactly. So, so we switch from menus to command bars, and there's, you know, that's a difference. And and so the existing users wound and, and wail and gnash their teeth, and it's like, yeah, but firstly, it is better, so it, it works better. And secondly, it makes it look more modern. So there you go. Um, we refresh the icons, we refresh the colors, all of that stuff's easy yes. to do and you can do it globally yes. and um, and it doesn't big matter. Impact. You know, yeah, big impact for no effort. Make sure the font is up to date and all that kind of stuff. But beyond that, I, we do get users who say, oh, it looks old. And it's like, well, what do you want it to look like? Oh, no, I don't know. Okay, well, if you it, they show you a program and the program has got acres of white space and three settings in it and... Um, I want it to look more like the Windows control panel. And it's like, okay, that's got vertical scrolling in it. Do we want vertical scrolling in our app now? I'm not sure our existing users will thank us for that. So okay. there is this there's this balance where you're trying to say, oh, yes, look, we're nice and fresh and we look lovely. And, I, and I'm the first in line to say the programs don't have to look ugly. They can look really good. Um, and maybe it's 2D icons and maybe it's 3D icons and maybe it's got shading this week and maybe it's got flat the next week and so on. Um, there's lots of things you can do little effects that, that spruce it up. Um, the color palette that you choose might be of the moment or not. Um, there were once upon a time bright colors were in and then pastels were in and then sort of earth so, yeah, tones were in. And, you know, it's it's just, yeah. Um, I got an offer today from um, Axelis, uh, latest icon set on, on offer, and they seem to have toned down um, the, the same icons which are in the other sets, but they're all, like say, more pastel, not quite as garish and so on. Yeah. So that seems to be more the latest flavour. Yeah, yeah, so I, I would, you know, by all means change the styling, but but I would hesitate to change any functionality. And Yeah. 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 I think there's some, there's some which we kind of take for granted on some stuff. I mean, everything, what we just said, nice and easy changes, uh, icons, everything, everything we just said, you know, uh, but there's also sometimes you do also want to add other types of controls. Like John and I in a Monday webinar, we said about uh, having a new button and we've seen it in QuickBooks, but uh, it's like a split button and you can do so much just off that. And then that, that replaces 
three or four other buttons. But you still go into that same place for it. The default is just a new, I don't know, let's say it's a patient system, a new patient. But then you've got a split button to say, oh, you're adding a family member. So it's still new, but you're going uh, out of the way. But it's not it's not necessarily there all the time. Um, it's, it's more of a, an additional button. So you, you're freeing up uh, a bit of screen space by adding that kind of control. So there's something to be said about still looking at new type of controls as well. And, and for that, we did. We looked at... Yeah, it was quick books, but um, we pitched pitch ideas for plenty of other places too as well. Yeah. You'll see, you see something, what you think, oh, that's a smart UI, and then replicate it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I hear you. Makes sense. All right, gents. Thank and you, Daniel. Thanks, everybody. Question. I'll stay here for questions and answers. Yeah, you try get that. To just try moving now. that. To, I'm, I'm interested to see that iconized if it does actually do anything. Uh, mm. So you, you, you can do the legwork for that, Daniel. But yeah, just on the iconized event, just um, set it well, zero zero one hundred one hundred whatever. But just does that iconized window then move? That's what I'd be interested in because if it does, I shall have a then you can move it to the device that it was originally. Yeah, iconized yeah. Of. If you can move it, if you can control it, then you can move it. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know if you can control it. I've never can't say I've had the uh, requirement to, but um, yeah, it'd be interesting. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Thank you. Mike has an X-Files question. Mike, are you there? Hello. Hello, Michael. How are you, how are you doing? Hi, I'm fine. Uh, so I have uh, an XML with... Uh, Big uh, characters and fields. Yes. yes. Interesting. Yes. All right. I'm going to make you share your screen. Yes. Uh, da, 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 permit panelist. Okay, do you see it? Yes, we can. Yes. You start uh, with uh, English characters and then goes to Greek. <laughs> okay. I never I see it. Presumably, this is point. in UTF 8. Yes. UTF 8. How can I work this in X-Files? Well, that's where it gets complicated because it's UTF-8. Because Clarion doesn't do Unicode strings. Um, so I'm going to suggest you do two things. I'm going to suggest first that you open the XML file in string theory, you load it up in that, you convert it to ANSI, and then you save it. Now, when I say you convert it to ANSI, you obviously you can use the string theory to ANSI function, but you'll also need to replace okay. that, that encoding at the top. If you scroll right to the top where it says encoding, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll also um, replace that little bit of text. You can use the set between function in, in string theory. Because these names, you can use these names. Yes, I know. In, in your Clarion program, but they would have to be ANSI versions of these names. So then they would just be external names, just like any other external name. As long as they were ANSI, you'd be okay. But a UTF, I don't think you can do it in UTF because Clarion can't do, the Clarion compiler can't do UTF 8. So it can't compile external names. I, there's a, I mean, there's an outside chance one could, could hack it, if if I spent, if I if I cared enough to put it that way, but I don't. So, um, I think your best option is to convert because it's Greek, so it's just one language. You can do a conversion to ANSI. Um, so convert the whole XML to ANSI first, and then treat it as ANSI after that. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, but uh, if I 
and convert this in enhancing. Then, how can I get it in? Uh, well, that thing there. If you just copy that thing, you could highlight it into your um, into your clipboard and go to your Claren. That'll just be the external name for a field. So, in uh, the, okay. Yes. And, and in fact, could probably even be the variable name. I don't know. Um, I imagine it can be. I don't know there's any restriction on characters in a variable name. It might be, but we, we'll find out. But otherwise, it's just the external name. But obviously, the ANSI version of that is the external name, right? Not the UTF-8 version of that. Yes, yes. That is the ANSI external name. It's just an external name, yeah. I'm sure you can pronounce it. You can read it. Um, give it a try. Okay, I'll try it. Yeah, interesting question. It'd be, it'd be interesting to let us know next Thank week you. how you're doing. Yes. I made many. Oops. <laughs> Sorry, I muted yeah. Michael there. Come back, mute Michael. Yes, yes, yes. I made many, many XML until now, but uh, I never see. No. Like this. Yeah. And, and fortunately, it's all Greek. It's not something, it's not mixed up languages, that, which would make it much more complicated. Yes, but uh, he starts with... Uh, uh, oh, no, English is fine. English. Because Eng <laughs> when I say it's just Greek, then, I mean, it's it's not Chinese. It's not Thai or something like that thrown in. Hebrew. No. If you had a mix of Greek and Hebrew, then um, it would get really complicated very quickly. Mm -hmm. But it's just, it's just the one language. So it's conversion to ANSI straightforward. Okay, I'll try it. Thank you very Excellent. much. Uh, Rodney says, is there a particular site where we can get free icons? I'm a fan of the icons used by Kevsoft to template examples. Uh, Rodney, I recommend you watch um, webinar number 300, Friday webinar number 300. Um, I went into icons, how I generate the icons and so on. I use a program, a free program, which is always a good idea, called uh, Metro Studio. And it's by, I'll tell you now, I haven't updated in a while, actually. I should check if there's an update. Sync Fusion. If you search for Sync Fusion Metro Studio, um, it's got a gazillion icons and you can just download it. I covered that in the, um, that webinar number 300. I use that and with um, Iconworks to generate our icons. Got a huge set of icons that we use internally. But generating icons take you a day, two days to, to get your set right. And it makes it's probably the biggest bang for your buck in terms of updating your program. Nothing, nothing makes a program look worse than a set of unmatched icons or a mix, you know, a mix set or old icons. Like the ones that ship with tops with 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 Karen or like from 1985 or something, and they look terrible. <laughs> Guaranteed to make your program look terrible. It's built in terribleness. There have been icon sets along the way, but that's the one I use. Right. Now, someone cryptically called AR, which I presume is Iman, has got a second question. Iman, are you there? Is it Iman? Yes, it is. Iman. Ah, you see, I see your name getting shorter and shorter every week, eh? You very, play by the letter, very, obviously. Very cunning. Yeah. How do you do? Not too bad. Not too bad. How are you going? Very good. Very good, very good. Bruce, I've been toying around with uh, with the Sequin for uh, a couple of weeks or more, and uh, I've shown uh, a prospect is not yet a, a customer. Uh, what can be done by way of security, by way of of uh, 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 that one person can add records, the other cannot delete records, and and and. One person can see salaries, the other one cannot uh, change them, and, and and you know the the restrictions, the restriction IDs that that are part of Sequin, and that was very nice and went very good. And then he asked me what about delegation, and uh, I said, uh, of course we can do that. This is uh, goes without saying. <laughs> do you mean? Yeah, and and, and I started. Uh, uh, discovering or rather uh, going around this, of course, that I've said, and uh, I would like uh, guidance in this exploration. 
<laughs> so it so might question, not be the first time. Yeah, yeah the question what, I would it, have for you yeah, yeah. is what did he mean by delegations? When one person goes out of office, somebody stands in for him. And right. the way they have seen this being done in other systems is that there usually would be another account uh, that uh, that is a carbon copy of the out of office person and uh, and uh, and this 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 new account this other account uh, would have uh, the password reset and sent to the delegate okay and it would expire after a couple of weeks the i i started thinking about copying users from from one user to the other and then i thought that perhaps i, I shouldn't be using users perhaps every user should be a group actually and 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 we can create as many copies of 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 the group of of, of that person but the issue is that when the person comes back from his vacation uh he gets to uh, see everything that the delegate did during the couple of weeks so the account is not like does not disappear the account is still accountable for what it has done over the couple of weeks and this is where i'm at right away there is an, one further uh, uh, complication to the question is that uh, and i started thinking thinking about uh, row level uh, security when when a person goes out of office he does not have to delegate everything to a single person he might delegate uh, uh, i don't know uh, 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 tasks related to uh, account x to one person and tasks related to account Y to another person. So basically, uh, it's 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 row level security, but I don't know how to achieve that. I I know how to do row level security, but I I will know how to split his his authorities into two accounts like that using Sequin at least. So uh, I know it's it's more of an exploration. Uh, then, yeah, then. so you've got some choices in how you set it up and how you go about it. So certainly copying the rights from one user to another user is trivial. If if because the rights are in the user record as a as a big blob, it's trivial to say, okay, I'm creating and this is specifically I'm creating a new user and I just want to prime that user with a, a specific set of rights. So if you were going to do delegation Let's say um, I'm going on holiday and I'm, I, we're hiring a temp to do my job and we're going to put the temp into the system. We're going to give the temp the same rights as me. Um, at least as a starting point, we could then remove some rights if we wanted to or give them other rights if we wanted to. Um, but in terms of creating a new user, you could clone a user to create a new user from that starting point. That, that would be very straightforward. Um, it's slightly more difficult to say, okay, I want, you know, I'm going on leave. I want Jeff to have my rights. Now, Jeff is already a user in our system. He exists. He's going to exist forever. But while I'm away, he gets rights to me. He gets my rights. When I come back, I, I take away the rights from me, you know, my rights. But he keeps all his own rights. He may have rights to different parts of the system on his own. That would be slightly more complicated to do because in that situation, we wouldn't want to actually change Jeff's record at all. We would just want to say, oh, for the moment, Jeff inherits rights from another user. Um, I don't Can think you, do you that? could. Well, no, um, that would that would need code. That would need that would need some sort of um, layer of of when we load Jeff, we we say, oh, Jeff's got extra rights. We need to load rights from other users as well. That okay, can certainly be done, what, but it would take code to do that. Wh and that specifically. What if we started by creating a, a group for every user? Yeah. So that uh, so, uh, we can associate it with Jeff for the couple of weeks that you're away. Yeah. I mean, in, in, in most situations, you very much do create groups, even if, the even if there's only one person in the group to start with. 
And the reason you do that is because never mind if the person goes on holiday for two weeks. It's what happens if the person leaves and we're going to hire a replacement. We want to give the new person the same rights as the old person. And the easiest way by far, you know, what if you hire a second person into that department um, and now you say, okay, well, that person also needs all the same rights. So in terms of organization, it's almost always a good idea to put users, to create groups, um, sometimes around what a user does, sometimes around specific bits of functionality. So I might have a, someone who in our office who does uh, payroll, who does accounts, who does human resources. Um, and they, she's got all those, those functions. But then we, she might have one assistant to do payroll, one assistant to do human resources. So in that situation, we'd create a payrolls group, we create a human resources group, and we'd put the, the boss lady into all three groups and we'd put the assistants into the groups that they belong to. Um, groups are a very efficient system. And Mike calls them doors, but, but they're the same kind of idea. Um, they, 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 they say, here's a set of rights. They don't belong to a person as much as they belong to a function. And yeah. whoever's got that function <laughs> gets rights to that group. That, that's much less work than trying to maintain rights on a user basis. Now, sometimes what you do on the user basis is you say, I know, you know, um, that here's my payroll assistant and they've got all my payroll rights, but actually I'm going to take away the ability to set salaries. Only the primary purpose is going to do that. So there's there's a small tweak you make to that person, or maybe you set the group so they can't set salaries, but then the person who's in charge can set the salaries. You give her a, a rights to do that. Um, yeah. Or sometimes you create a whole group of set salaries and it's only got one right in it, which is to be able to set the salary. So uh, it depends how you want to set it up. But yes, groups is a very efficient way of setting up access control because then people can get assigned to a group, taken out of a group. It's a very, that's a very, very straightforward thing. But anyone can figure out how to do. Um, when you start delegating rights, it's like, okay, I go on leave, so I delegate all my rights to Jeff, but then Jeff got sick, so he delegated all his rights to Rob. Now, can Rob do my stuff? Does he inherit my delegate, you know, delegation? Does he only get – it becomes quite complicated to understand and quite variable in terms of what you wanted to do, whereas groups are very much – you just set them up and give the guy rights to the group, don't give him rights to the group, do whatever you want, basically. So that's a much, much simpler, much uh, – it's a much simpler system to explain to an end user and it's much more chance that they're going to get it right. Whereas I think if you just start delegating rights from an existing user to, a, to some other user for a period of time, that doesn't sound like something they would easily understand when it starts getting complicated. Like what happens if the circuit person goes away? Can one person inherit rights from three different people? Um, you know, what if me yeah, and Jeff yeah. both go away? Can we both delegate our rights to Robert? How many people can they, you know, it starts getting very complicated very quickly. Does it make it, sense? It, it, it does make sense, but uh, there remains the question of, uh, of how does the, the how, how do you uh, get to review what Jeff did while you were away? I mean, when, well, the, you, you, so, you get to set the salaries of everybody, okay? And and you've delegated that right to Jeff for, because you're going away for 10 days. Yes. How do you re, do, do you check whether Jeff uh, gave himself a raise while you were away? Good question. <laughs> um, so essentially, if you're going to track who did what, that's to some extent outside the scope of Sequin. That's just generic tracking who did what um, in your program. And then who gets to see who did what is, a, is you know, just a simple filter. Um, it's not really related to anything in the second database itself other than you'll track their username, you know. So it, it's, not, it's not a bad idea to track certain things like who changed the salary. It's not, never mind Jeff, what about if I change my own salary? Someone should be able to see that that happened. Um, or anyone change the salary. There's a few things you'd want to track if they change stuff. Um, if you want to track every last thing Jeff did while he was there, then you have to log everything Jeff does into some sort of log that you can read. So that's that's a, that's a separate question, really, to Sequin. That's more of a, a logging question. 
Um, and there are tools. And I think Andy's got one that lets you log everything in site and lets you go back and see what it does. John was working with Honeycomb, I think, John, to log stuff. Yes. Um, so, yeah, there are logging systems that you can make use of. Um, if you want to log vast amounts of stuff, if you if there's a few things, you know, again, I would I would sit there and say, well, that's not a function they would delegate. You know, there's no good reason for that person to be changing someone's salary or they have a right to change it, in which case we log when salaries are changed. Um, you know, we log when certain things are done. Um, they, 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 you know, there's always systems where it's like, oh, I didn't change it, nobody changed it, but suddenly the server name is different. Um, and yeah. that's why I can't connect the database. Yeah, that's just logging. Log whatever you want to log. Yeah. And about the uh, role level security, can can uh, Sequin uh, come to the help there, or uh, is it the, the so, coding? Yeah, or I mean, role level security is functionally uh, an issue of filters, right? So yeah. you have to decide um, on a system. Presumably, you, because it gets complex, it's every every program is different. So yes, you can use Sequin to do it, but you'll ultimately uh, assign the rights to the user. You've got the attributes where you can add as many attributes as you want. So I would set up a, an attribute, if it was me, I'd set up some sort of system whereby I mark the records who owns them. Maybe there's an owner field in there. Um, and then in my attributes, I would say, okay, well, whose fields can I see? Mine and who else's? And then that's a function of the of the filter on that browse. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Uh, not in the context that I was okay. asking about. Okay, so Take let's say, for example, who? we've got a list of employees. All right. Uh, and um, when an I, I have an example. I have a good example. How about two okay. warehouses? Yeah. Two warehouses in two different cities. The, 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 the store people uh, can see their, uh, can see all of their stocks. Yeah. In, in, in every store. But they can change only the, the the stocks that belong in their geography, right? Yes. Okay. So in 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 that example, in that context, how does Sequin help? Well, you would allow the person to view the barrels for all the stock items, right? So there would be no security on the brass. But each stock record would have to be bound to a geography, a, a branch. And so when you go into the form, you could test whether the user's current branch matches the records branch. And if it is, you let them go into the form. If it isn't, then you say, sorry, you can't, you can't edit this record and you jump out. And you would add code for that, for that test. Yeah. Um, it starts with yeah. saying, I want to keep a record, a stock record for every branch. So every branch has its you know, branch name, stock item level whatever um yeah. and then in that in that particular form you would say okay well this person doesn't you know has to have rights they have a they have a that person has a branch set of branch rights or rights to different branches or whatever because this won't be one branch right <laughs> it'll be yeah. until the regional manager can look after these 10 branches or something like that um yeah so in the, again in that situation i'd make an attribute for the user and i'd put in there the, his branch name or branch names, so I make it a list. And then when I'm yeah. I'm looking at the um, when I'm looking at the form, probably at the form, um, I'd probably let them do whatever they like on the browser. You could filter the browse by branch, you could do all kinds of things. Um, yeah. but on the form you would be able to you'd be able to say, hang on, if if there's a get attribute for a current user, you can do a, a current user dot get attribute branches. And then see if the name of the record is in that list. Yeah, that makes sense. Yes, Definitely. those kind of those kind of things tend to be. I mean, I know it sounds like a lot of work, but they tend not to be a lot of that. They're not generally kind of all over. Usually, it's like a whole bunch of tables can only be updated by um, an administrator or supervisor, and then you have this these tables <laughs> which are belong to the branch, and yeah, they're, they're kind of. Other people can see the data, but perhaps not edit it and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. 
Pleasure. Thank you, Bruce. Cool. Pleasure. You have to be creative. Yeah. Um, Mike, there's a question for you from Dan. Oh, wait, where's Mike on? Yeah, Dan wants to know. Yeah, okay. Well, if Mike comes back, we'll ask him, Dan. But he'll have to be quick. <laughs> Danielle, do you have any update for us? Danielle's not talking to me. Mm. There she comes. Danielle? Did you hear me? We can, yes. Yep. Good. No, I don't have an update just yet. I'm still playing around. Okay. Well, you okay. can let us know next uh, week. Yes, I will. Um, just on the question, the, the user that had the question about the icons, um, I wanted to mention that I use a program, I don't know how you pronounce it, but it's Pichon, P-I-C-H-O-N, um, to create all my icons in. Oh, excellent. Good tip. So, and I also Pichon. use Metro Studio, but I use Metro Studio to change them and do other finicky things around them. Uh, them what's the them. website for Pichon? Because I've got to a bunch of someone's wedding photos. Oh, that's not fun. <laughs> um, I'm running it at the moment. Let me quickly have a squiz. Must have an icon here. P-I-C-H-O-N. The website is icons8.com. I C O. Oh, oh yes, icons8. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've used and icons8. It changed names last year or earlier this year. The product yeah. it used to be called, I think, icons8 or something. Yeah. Again, it comes down to consistency. I I, I did use icons8, but then I found that because they have a particular style, Metro have a particular style, and they they're close but not quite the same. I kind of just yeah. settled on one. Um, but yes, Icons 8 has got lots and lots and lots of icons. Um, yeah. We go with icons. just one. Then it's, it, you know that they're all of the same design. Yeah. But I mean, there's, you know, any, there's lots and lots of these kind of things, aren't there? Um, and they're all good. Yep. All good. That's all for That's me. Nice. Thanks, James. Excellent. Thank you, Daniel. Yes, Icons 8. I might even have mentioned it in the webinar, come to think of it. I think we have mentioned it in the past. Yeah. 300, a big 300, which it's hard to believe we're way past 700 now, John. <laughs> 400 webinars ago. Oh, I dear. know, I know. All right. Well, look at that, on the hour. And we've done all the questions. We have. Well, that's, you know that's a prophecy there, John. Oh, okay. Sign. Just signed it. Did you want to see a, a chat GPT update? Sure. You've got or two minutes. Not. I have two minutes for this one. Usually <laughs> I get, don't I get six minutes? I know, minutes? but the top of the hour will be in two minutes. It'll be a nice round number. Then we'd be like one hour long. Okay. Um, yeah, so I can show you what I've discovered here. Hold on a second. Well, someone said it's actually webinar 310. No, it's 300. Icons. I have not just uh, Rod Rodney's just reported back. Okay, so Hi. I learned about this yesterday. Custom GPT.ai. And this lets you upload your own data. And then it ties into chat GPT, I guess he uses their engine or something, and then it will use the data that you've uploaded to answer questions. So you could, if you had a company that had a product and you have a knowledge base, you could feed the knowledge base into it and um, put a little chat thing on your website and it would, people could ask you questions and it would draw off of that information instead of drawing off all of the knowledge that chat, chat, chat GPT has. So I've uploaded stuff. Um, I went ahead and, and I got the $49 plan just to play with. And this is what I, I uploaded all the Clarion PDFs up to it. And so they're at this moment, they're queued. They haven't processed them yet. So I don't know how long it takes to process. But these are all the ones that come with Clarion. And the, 
and a couple I also put in the in memory driver and the um, what's the other one DFD dynamic file driver I put those in here too so all the clearance stuff is in here so maybe by Friday it'll be indexed and we can ask it questions mm. okay so I think it'll be interesting you can do um, let's see my projects yeah that's support that's the dashboard I thought there was something else You know, that was project settings. Here's where it is. It's hidden kind of project settings. Okay, here you go. So you can do things with this. Uh, here's data. So you can add more things in. You can add a site map, which I don't even know how to make a site map, but I guess you can add that in here. So you can, it, it gave an example of looking at your competitors' sites and then comparing it with your features and stuff. So you could do comparisons between your product and other people's products, that kind of thing. Or upload files this is where you drop it in upload files you can this is the chat bot that you could add to your website um, so this gives you a way to do that and kind of customize it or you can share it so I can share the link with somebody here it is share the link and, and put the bot on your website or help desk live chat or you can API use APIs with it to do do it by yourself so anyway, I'll be kind of exploring, poking around this to see what all it does. Seems pretty interesting. I think they're not the only one that does this. Yeah, nothing going on there yet. Okay, so that's that's that. We'll see how that looks on uh, Friday. And then this is what I was playing with um, the other day. I was just I was trying to see how much it knew about Clarion. And if we go to the top of this, it was, I, was a, I asked it how a decimal is declared in Clarion because I couldn't remember if it was, it was decimal parentheses 12.2 or 12 comma 2. I was kind of thinking it was 12 comma 2, but I wanted to ask it. So I asked it, and this is like a, a .NET answer for Clarion.net. It seems to know a lot about Clarion.net, but not so much about regular Clarion. So I said, that's wrong. You're confusing Clarion.net with Clarion. It says he apologized for it, and all of a sudden he's declaring a real instead of a decimal, which I don't know where he got the idea I wanted to do a real. Um, but then I said, I didn't ask for that. I asked for a decimal. And then I said, standard Clarion, not Clarion.net. And then it came up with the right answer. I love John's arguing with <laughs> I know. I didn't ask for that. Just pressed, you could have just pressed F1 in the, in the IDE, but you know, let's not go there. What are you talking about? Sometimes when I press F1 in the IDE, the IDE crashes. So I, I actually avoid, uh, yeah, that's if I've been working in it for a while, I don't even yeah, it's, do it's the only help. A I, thing. I know it is. I launched another version, another Clarion, and then pulled the help. Or I could just put help on a link, but I don't do that. Mm. I just asked it. It was here. It was next to me. I asked it. It's just like I would ask Bruce something and he would give me the wrong answer. I'd say, Bruce, what are you talking about? Uh, you, you asked it, then you corrected it, then you argued with it, then you asked it again, and then and you got the right answer. It. <laughs> well, yeah. Okay, that's how I, I, I feel right. pressing the question. It. <laughs> One is faster. I know. This is kind of nice, I think, because it gives you the thing and then it describes it and then it gives you an example of what it looks like. Although this isn't really a good example. I don't know what this is. You couldn't do this. No, you can't do that. That's a C <laughs> no. thing. Now they've mixed up things again. So I didn't bother uh, with that though. Um, so then I start to do, do this using standard Clarion, not Clarion.net, write a class to convert a Clarion date and Clarion time to Unix time. I just, this isn't anything I needed. I just wanted to see what it would do. Okay. So it says, blah, 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 you can do this. Unix time. So it describes these things, which is nice. I like the descriptions. That's really good. And then here's a sample. Uh, code here. So first it does this, which is like, that's nothing that's in Clarion as well. This is looks to me like a Clarion.net thing or a .net thing. And then includes it again for no reason. So you got to ignore those kinds of things. But then it made a nice equate here. So that's okay. I thought we can't really see what's going on off to the side so much, but you can figure it out with comments. So it tells me what it's doing. Seconds in a day. That's right. Hundreds in a second, hundred. So it got these correct. I believe. Uh, December 28th, 1800. That's when it all starts, right? 
global Unix time class, Epoch. Unix time long, Epoch time. Yeah. <sighs> I don't know. Get Unix time, real long, long procedure. I don't know why I'm passing a real as a clarion date. It could, could just be a long. This Unix time equals, and then it has a formula that again goes, yeah, oh, and I, can, it, I can move it over. It hasn't declared over. this Unix time either. That's not a thing. No, it's not. Yep. Oh, um, it's, yeah, it's supposed to be this, I think. No, oh, self Unix time. But yeah, Unix time would have to be a real. Yeah, Unix time would have to be a real because Yon Long is not nearly big enough for a Unix time. Um, no, up here. Well, yeah. no, that's not true. Long is big enough, but it'll, it'll time out in, in 2038. So there's a built in Y38K. Mm. Y2, I don't know, whatever it is. Um, not, not, not my bug to fix. I don't care about what happens. Clarion <laughs> date minus zero base century. Yeah, okay. Time seconds in a day plus Clarion Oops. time. Hopefully, you scroll sideways. Well, Epoch was 1970, not. Unix I'm Epoch is January 1st, 1970. Unix Epoch. So that, that yeah. I, I, you'd have to I've check and see. That. Whether the um, let's have a look see if they got the date right for that that thing. Hang on one second. Well, what do you want to look at? Well, I, I've got a thing that'll tell me what the date. Well, same number of days from December twenty eighth, eighteen hundred. Yeah, that's the Clarion. That's when Clarion starts. Although it's January the fourth, eighteen hundred, I think. Um, so the first of January nineteen seventy is Clarion date six one seven three zero. What did they have? Uh, so define that equate. Oh, that number's wrong. This one. Yeah, that number's hmm. wrong. It should be six one seven three zero. Yeah, they've taken that from eighty eight eighteen hundred. Yeah. But 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 that should be that's that's Clarence date right? Clarence start date. Well, it is, depends on how it's being used though, because so. it's saying the Unix date is up. Minus yeah, they're just the, saying do you take the Clarence date. So today's Clarence date is eighty thousand and a change, and, then, and you yeah. subtract six one seven thirty, which is fine. You get about twenty thousand days. So you multiply that by seconds. Day. That formula is right, but oh, okay. the, the equate is wrong. But the equate the is way off. Yeah, yes. the equate is way off. It's off by, and I'm not even sure where they got that number from. Because that's not the number of days from December 28, 1800 to, to yeah. the 1st of 1st, 1970. Um, so it's kind of. It's quite class. Okay. Code. So there's a procedure here. But then this ends up somewhere in the middle of the procedure. It's, it's just not right. It's just not right. There's code there's a lot here, of there's code here, but there's no procedure above this part of it so that's not right so yeah it's got some work to do so i'm wondering what i'm wondering is if i type this same question um when this is done indexing will i get a better answer and that's so a good I'll, question i'll do that comparison and we'll see what happens because this has the language in it this everything is in here i would think here's the language reference here Learning Clarion is here, and, and all sorts of things are here. So, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what it does. Okay. But not right now. <laughs> because be it's still indexing. Yeah, exactly. In other news, Rodney's correct. It's not webinar number 300, but it's also not number 310 as far as I can see. Unfortunately, my search isn't working for some reason of its own. Oh, I tell you. You win some, you lose some. Now, what? I think it was 300. Is it 400, maybe? <laughs> I searched on icon now, and it won't give me back an answer. Oh, no, wait. 296. It, it did come, finally come back with an answer. 296 webinar. That's the one I was referring to, Rodney. Yeah, 296. Oh, huh, I thought it was 300. But 300 is the start of the API series, which makes sense as well. 
So there you go. There just, you go. There you go. Just as a side note, we'll, we'll see how this works with the custom GPT.ai, but you can also feed in YouTube um, videos to it and it will get the transcripts and load that up as well. So in theory, we could take all the Clarion Live recordings that are on YouTube and load it into the custom GPT.ai. And then you could search over all the recordings and it would come back and tell you which recording and where the timestamp was mm. for what it found. I, I think this is where that the value is, um, where <laughs> you can set up good. these custom custom data sets. Um, and 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 potentially like you know get it say okay this website this website this website is where I want you to get information from mm -hmm. um, these you know just kind of pare down the training a little bit to something that's likely to be more applicable so if you can say yeah I, this is the language we're talking about this is the you know feed it the Clarion language help feed it the various accessories help us whatever um, Clarion live webinars it can get information from all sorts of places. But they're places that are, we know are on topic. Let's put it that way. Um, and so yes. the answers might might be much more useful in the long run. I think it's a really interesting route to go down. I'm for sure going to play with it. It does, um, for the $50 a month, you get 500 queries, which can be a lot or not a lot. I don't know. Do I do more than 500 in a month? For one person, standard is uh, it's ninety nine a month, and you get a thousand queries. But see, if I was going to put all of Clarion Live on there, and everybody wanted to come in and and look for something, would we get more than a thousand queries in a month? If it was useful, I you would. No, yeah. In which case, you got to go to premium, which is five hundred dollars a month, yeah. and that's five thousand queries per month. But it would probably index pretty much all of the all of the stuff. But yeah, still, five hundred dollars a month. So then, then you're on something where we've got to, you know, you got to have a subscription program. You got to have a subscription to it. Yep, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, can you share your model? Can you share your custom once you once it's trained up? Can you say, okay, I'm going to give this thing a name. Someone else can get their own jolly subscription package, but they can use my model. Oh. Oh, to like use the index? I don't see that option here. It had a share thing, but I think that's, oh, we just looked at that. I don't think that does what you're thinking. Like since you've indexed it already, then you could go and do it or whatever. Yeah, other people are interested in using that index. Um, I'll look into that and see. I don't. Because that would also know. be really useful from a commercial program's point of view. So we can feed mm -hmm. it all our documentation and then our right. customers can access it. But those that want to access it a lot will need to get their own subscription, you know, that kind of thing. But they can they can subscribe yeah. to our model. I don't know. Yep. Somehow you gotta pay for that five hundred bucks a month. <laughs> it's gotta it's gotta yeah. come from somewhere. Well either yeah, we, we either charge them or or not, I suppose it's the case maybe. Yeah. Anyway, we'll see. We will uh, we'll talk about it more on Friday. Uh, because I'll I should everything's indexed by then. I can do some tests. Cool. There you go. All right. What's happening right. tomorrow, Bruce? Tomorrow, Net Talk, we already know Mark's got a question. So that you'll be front of the line, I suspect. Um, that'll happen tomorrow. And then, um, of course, questions and answers. And I might show a little bit more about Net Talk 14. I've got a, a new feature. I went down a rabbit hole on Friday. And um, yeah, something that, that you think, oh, let me, let me experiment with this. And it's now Wednesday and I'm still writing docs and doing all kinds of things. So, yes, I have another room. question. Yes, Danielle. Sorry, guys, I know you want to go. Um, when I'm exporting data from Clarion to Access using the ODBC driver, so the standard Microsoft um, Access ODBC, um, is there something I need to do to get the decimal places on a decimal field to go across? because it's dropping all my decimals despite that I'm declaring it as a integer or a long number in the access side. Okay, well, if they're decimals, they can't be an integer. They'll say they can't be an integer or a long, then they have to be. So they have to be something. So what can... type must they be on the access side to accept the decimal from Clarion? Come on, Andy, you've got to have a, a password access. 
<laughs> I, never, I never did. Uh, no, that's a Paul thing. He's got the class for access. Um, I would guess it's string and then use a formatting facility. Hmm. A string like real, something like a long and integer you can't use. You, you could Google what's the decimal type in access. But but a long is specifically going to drop the decimal part. Mm, yeah, it's not a long. Um, it gives you the option of number. So. Oh, well, that'd be, uh, number sounds good. But it's dropped, it I'm using number currently, and I've specified the decimal places to be however many. It has to be nine or whatever. Um, and it's dropping all my decimals. Hmm. How does it make you feel? We, you see, I, we can't help you, but but a lot of psychotherapy is not is not helping you, but making you feel better about how bad it is. So uh, yeah. we'll switch to, you know, how does that make you feel? I don't know. I don't, I've never used access. I couldn't tell you. Yeah. You could change it to a string. That would be my next, yeah, do what Andy says. Change it to a string on the export, change it to a string on the import. Now you've got a string. Yeah, so on my side, I for my testing, I've changed it to currency which seems to be a workaround, but it's not ideal. There you go. All right. Thank you, guys. Good can, luck, Daniel. Can I just say in Access, this is Mary. Um, they oh. have, um, when you declare a number, <coughs> excuse me, a number field, you can set the decimal places. And Mary, I've need... done that. And despite what I've set, it's not doing that. All right, that was my best guest. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks Daniel, so much. Daniel, you say it's uh -huh. exporting and importing. Are you, are you going via any tool? Any, is, it, is it going via another field or is it literally just using the access file driver? It's just straight using the ODBC driver. Hmm. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> I just wonder whether it was going by something else and, you know, that was What's marking the it. The ODBC in your program, because you've got to have declared mm -hmm. an ODBC structure. What did you use there? Yeah. Um, I've used ODBC in Clarion and then yes. on the PC itself, I've no, no, set no, but, it up but, but, as but access. On, but, but in your, you've got an, a file structure in your dictionary that's marked with so the in ODBC In my dictionary, um, I'm going to lie if I tell you that. Let me double check that quickly. Okay, so I've gone the route that, that you've already suggested. I've gone string because that was the only way I could get it to carry the decimals. Um, well, what uh, if it's the only BC? Because uh, I, I don't use that what, too, uh, what did too you often. Try? What types do you have? Um, so I've tried decimal and I've tried long. So yeah, long won't work, but yeah. decimal yeah. might have worked as long it, as you know doesn't. that it's length, comma places, not left of the dot, right of the dot. Yeah. So yeah. So we're using decimal fifteen dot two um, yeah. on the one I'm looking at right now, and it's only taking across the fifteen, not the dot two. Yeah, okay. Then a string. Go for a string. Okay, and then we, we use a heck of a lot of access pivot tables, not access, um, Microsoft Excel pivot tables. Um, but we're finding that our data set in Excel has gotten too big for the pivot tables to run effectively. The, the, they're just too slow. So we're looking at putting some of it into access to run the pivot tables. Um, Who's the go-to person on pivot tables? Oh, definitely Mike. Mike. Did a, yeah, Mike did a, present, <laughs> a, a webinar on pivot tables. Um, where was it? Was it, was it, when, was it a paid training one or was it uh, an open webinar? I'm not sure if it was a CIDC yeah. one. Was it CIDC, oh, Mike, John? Mike, Mike doing a pivot table yeah, one. Could be. But you, you would have been there, Danielle, if he did. So check your um, check your CIDC thing if there's a mic. It's got a pivot tables in there. Okay, but I'll have a squiz. Thank you. That's all I can say because I've never done a pivot table in Excel or Access. So. Yeah. Good luck. Thank you. Interesting. That's all from me. Although, Good night, everybody. 
I don't think we'll train on it, Danielle, but um, the Dev Extreme uh, plug in what we're doing onto NetTalk, that'll support pivot tables. But it's just not available yet. So sorry about that. Dangle the carrot and then take it away. <laughs> Mark, Mark <laughs> thinks Mike's pivot table thing was a Friday webinar. So give that a try, Danielle. I will have a squiz. Thanks. Yeah, I did a All search. Right. I didn't come up with anything on pivot, but. I'm sure Mike did one. Yeah, I do remember. It sounds more CIDC ish to me. Mm, I, Where'd my coming in? Where'd he go? Yeah, uh, where he gone? <laughs> went to find his glasses. The, uh, so, just one, one, one quick one there. So, I'm not available on Friday. I'm a, I'm away and I'm at a place called Melton Mulberry. And if memory oh, serves. Pies. Exactly. Nice so, pie. I'm just going to quickly share a window. And Bruce, I will report back what that yeah. looks like and what that tastes like. Oh, they're amazing! I'll, they, I, they I will do the research for you in the UK. I actually make them here. Um, probably not the exact same recipe, but but very similar. Um, I, I love cold pork pie. Wonderful. So, well, if it's from Melton Mulberry, but like champagne can technically only come from champagne, and Melton Mulberry pies can only come from Melton Mulberry yeah, and so yeah, on. Yeah. But I will, uh, I will, I'll, I'll, I'll take the hit and I'll do the research for you. Yeah. When I'm no, there. I mean, I, you know, you've got to do what you've got to do, Andy. You've got to, That's and it. and I wouldn't go with just one because you you never know oh, when no. you get an outlier. You have to do a proper sample, and they say for statistics, you need to at least thirty-one in a sample set. So, oh uh, my god, I, I recommend thirty-one. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, no, I learned how to make pork pies because um I like them and you you can't you can get them here, but they're massively expensive. So I, I make them. But um yeah. So for any vegetarians watching today, sorry about that. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not uh, that's the thing. All right, John, what's happening on Friday? Because I'm not gonna be there. Andy's not gonna be there. I know. I'm going to be there, Mike's gonna be there, and we are going to continue and look at the uh, ultimate debug. Pivot tables. No, for Deepak Viewer, and we're going to um, start changing the interface. That's what we're going to do. Cool. And we'll probably end up looking at the code behind the scenes, and it probably has to be refactored like crazy, because I wrote that a long, 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 long time ago, and I just made it work as best I could at that time. You just made it work, Ham? Huh? As best I could at that time, yes. Cool. All right. Well, Good luck on Friday. I am out as it happens. I have me a thing to do. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you same time, same place next week. Next tomorrow's Network Friday, Ultimate Debug Fear. On that note, first wave, second wave, third wave. Goodbye. Oh, that's it. Bye. That's it. Bye, everyone.